My dad was an engineer at NASA, and I always enjoyed science. My mom was a stay-at-home mom. She was a seamstress. So I was very detail-oriented. So when I was in high school, I knew I wanted to go into science, but I didn't know which aspect. I liked biology, didn't like chemistry, so I thought, well, I like medical technology. Long as I went into science, my dad was happy. So when I went to school, to college, I looked into the microbiology program, the med tech program, but then I thought, well, I don't want to spend all day testing baby poop, mm -hmm. you know, in a lab. I want to do something more interesting. So I went to the, actually to DC, mm -hmm. to the FBI, they had a tour, and I looked at their forensics lab, and I thought, well, that would be pretty cool, but I didn't know how to get into that. And so I thought, you know what, just get out of school, get a job, do what you need to do. Now, I want to ask, um, in, in high school, uh, did you like your biological science classes in particular? Yes, yes. I, I was actually in honors biology, so I really like that. And, and also, I think it's interesting that your dad worked for NASA. Did he bring his work home in any way? I mean, the most interesting thing was one, one day he brought one of the spacesuits home on a mannequin. And it was, I don't know why he did that. I don't know the occasion. I just really remember him bringing this mannequin in with the spacesuit and all the kids in the neighborhood coming into the house looking at the spacesuit. Yes, it was going to either be microbiology or zoology. Zoology dealt with it, a lot of insects and things like that. And I don't do insects. So I went on along with the microbiology aspect. You know, I love the study of bacteria and viruses and things like that. But again, it was slanted to be, you know, I was slanted to go into the medical technology field to work in a hospital laboratory. But, so I changed my mind about that. And then when I got out, I had the choice between two jobs, a research job or a job in industry working for a beer company that happened to be in Cleveland, Ohio at the time. It was a small brewery. I would have been responsible for growing the yeast that they use for making beer. Well, beer company, food companies, you know, all these, all these companies have quality control labs where people have to test things. In microbiology, you're looking for the good bacteria versus the bad bacteria. So I was looking at that, and I thought, wow, industry pays more than research. But my brother was the one who told me, he said, the universities are going to be there. These little companies might not be there which was actually a smart, smart move because once I took the research job, like a year or two later, the brewery closed. My entry job was as a, technician, a research technician in a lab that had a contract for the EPA. They were testing um, chemicals for the EPA and the tests were all blinded. You know, we would be given a substance and we'd be given a number and we would have to perform certain tests to see if it was a mutagen or not. Well, I'd done that for a few years, and it was getting boring. <laughs> and again, my mother was a seamstress. My grandmother was a seamstress. I learned how to sew as a child. I was very good at my hands, and I thought, well, let me go into surgery. It just, you know, I wanted to do surgery on animals. There was a researcher there who was looking for an entry-level tech to do all of the surgeries on his animals, his rats primarily. So he trained me. He had residents train me um, in how to do surgery, and I really, really enjoyed doing that. So that's how I got into the surgery aspect. And I spent a lot of time with the surgical residents, you know, learning how to do the, the closures and learning anatomy, things like that. And it was really interesting. It was very different. So I did that for a few years, working on grants. Unfortunately, grants run out after five years. So every five years, we were looking for a way to make sure we had money. That got to be real old. And I said, I can't just work on grants, you know. I've got to do something that's more permanent, that wasn't grant funded. And that's when I realized well, that's when the regulatory field was really becoming very popular in animal research. And my, the, the gentleman that turned out to be my mentor told me, I'm going to get you to work for me. I'm going to get you to do compliance. 
and you're going to like this. And I thought, I don't know anything about this. Mm -hmm. So he made sure I learned. And that's how I got into the regulatory aspect of research. In my first job, I knew I was looking to see if a chemical was a mutagen, if it would cause problems for humans or the environment, things like that. That's kind of all I knew. Once I got into surgery and really got into research, I knew that we were looking for a specific um, outcome. We were looking to prove something. That's when I started really looking at what the researchers were interested in achieving. And so your move from hands-on research to compliance, um, probably your experience with research was was good for you. It was very good for me because I saw it from, from both sides. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm glad I had that perspective because I knew the researcher side and then I knew the compliance side. So I knew what to look for. I knew what questions to ask. I knew how to relate to the people who were coming up to do research. Um, I dealt with a lot of people who had never handled research animals and I did training too, so I would have to train them on how to hold, restrain, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I was pretty patient with them. And this was still at, at Case Western? Uh, yes, yes, at Case Western. Mm -hmm. I was a training and compliance coordinator, and I was responsible for training um, some animal facility staff, research staff, on how to handle animals, minor procedures, you know, bleeding, things like that. Um, and I was, make, uh, I was responsible for making sure that people followed the rules and regs, which, which was the most challenging part of the job. Were you surprised by that? That it was challenging? Mm -hmm. No. Oh. <laughs> no, I wasn't surprised at all because people weren't used to the rules and regs back then. This is when things were just coming into being. So I knew it was going to be challenging, which is another reason I liked it. it, was, it to me, it was very interesting. I was working with uh, the IACUC to create policies. You know, I didn't create them on my own. I was creating um, some teaching opportunities to teach people how to do things, but policy was all done by the IACUC. On the researcher side, people do want to do the right thing. A lot of times, they just don't know what the right thing is. So when I went on the regulatory side, I knew that. And I thought, well, we have to make sure that people understand before you ding them for doing the wrong thing. So in other words, on the researcher side, if I didn't know how to do something and no one told me, then I'm thinking, well, if I had only known, I would have done the right thing. So when I went to the other side, I thought, OK, we need to let people know what they're supposed to do up front. I was mentored by a gentleman named Bob White. He was the animal facility director at Case Western back then. He was involved in uh, the Association for Lab Animal Science, ALAS, on a local and a national level. And he would drag me to the local meetings. And he would tell me, you need to meet people. When I would go to these meetings, I would essentially you know, just be his shadow. And he told me, he said, no, you need to get out. You need to meet people. They can help you. So when I started talking to people, they were talking to me about ALAS certification. And, and Bob would talk to me about it also. At the time, Case Western had an incentive program to um, increase your base pay if you achieved ALAS certification. Well, ALAS has three levels, and I just... I jumped right to the top. I didn't want to take all three levels, so I said, I'll take the highest level. And uh, that was because I was urged by Bob, and through the local branch of ALAS, I met people who were able to give me materials to read, things like that. So that's primarily what I did when I first stepped into the regulatory role. Is, is that kind of networking and educational experience still available now? Is, that, is this a typical path for somebody? A lot of uh, people who are in the husbandry field come through that path now because ALAS certification is still around and a lot of institutions recognize ALAS certification. So husbandry means? The people who actually take care of the animals. Yeah. A lot of people come through that path. I came through the research path. Mm -hmm. A lot of people come through the husbandry path.
I can think in general the care, the veterinary care that the research animals get is far above what the animals get in private practice. And that's not just my opinion. Every veterinarian I've ever worked with has said that. Yeah, it's sad. It's sad. I once worked with a veterinarian who worked in an inner city clinic. And the horror stories he would tell me about the, the condition the dogs would, or, or animals, not just dogs, would be in when clients would bring their animals in for treatments that they couldn't afford. And, you know, they would have to euthanize the animals because the clients couldn't afford to treat them. And it's just, it's sad. And a lot of people don't know how to take care of pets. In research, the animals are seen 365, seven days a week. They're seen every single day. And they do get excellent veterinary care. Not only that, the public would be surprised to know that there are more rules and regulations that we have to follow than they do in daycare centers, nursing homes. I mean, if you, for, for example, a dog room that has peeling paint on the ceiling that's not really affecting the animal, you can get cited for that. But if you go into a daycare center, you, I mean, there's no laws against peeling paint. I mean, obviously there are laws against lead paint for ch around children. But still, there are so many conditions that we have to adhere to that the general public would be surprised. How do you explain what you do to other people? I probably explain it, well, my daughter probably explains it the best way to a lay person. My daughter's 18, yet she's known when I've done forever. And she will tell people that I work in conjunction with a committee that reviews the work that researchers want to do to animals and we make sure that it's ethical and it's necessary. That's, that's it in a nutshell. She approves of what I do. She knows about it. Um, she's experienced animal rights activities. When she was very, very young, we went to a conference in Anaheim, and we were walking, out of, I think, out of the hotel to the convention center across the street. I think she was two or three, and they were out there protesting, and they were yelling at her, little girl, do you know what your mommy does for a living? And they were spitting on us and everything, yes, yes. So she's experienced that. That's happened at a couple of conferences that I've been at. I think people are very uninformed. Uh, what I found are that people are usually very, very young, very, very young. Um, I don't think they realize that, you know, because of animal-based research, we have vaccines, we have organ transplantation, we have blood transfusions, and they've probably taken part in all of these things, or some of these things, you know, vaccines at least. This field, the research field, needs to get to the children the way the animal rights field has gotten to the children. Through methods that children understand. You know, I, I know some organizations have made coloring books that are pro-research, things like that. Uh, people need to go into schools, but, you know, I think they need to get to the kids. I think it must be very difficult to be um, you know, an educated, well-intentioned person doing an important job, you know the value of what you do, and then to have the public outcry like that, um, it, it must be very difficult. It is, it is, but I think the very first time I experienced it, it was more difficult. Now, I, you know, we know to expect it, it's, it's a shame. In your opinion, what has Primer's role been with regards to animal welfare and the Iacut community? To me, Primer has been an organization that promotes what we do to the public. Um, one thing I like about Primer is the human and animal aspect. 
Um, I've met people on both sides and we talk about what we both do and I've learned a lot and they've learned a lot. So I think that, that Primer is very good in educating the public about what we do. Do you think that um, the human research and the animal research people are ever at odds with each, with each other? They're not, are they competitors or? Not, I wouldn't say they're competitors. I think they're just working on two different paths that their paths don't really cross that much. Sometimes they do. Um, I think in my experience, I've wor worked at, I've only seen one animal protocol that actually had a human component to it, and it involved teeth. But usually they're on two different paths. Yeah, completely different paths. Now, you serve on Primer's um, Diversity Advisory Group. Correct. Uh, how long have you been with this committee? Probably about two years. I think the, as long as the committee's been in existence, I think. And what's the goal of the committee? To increase diversity in the human research field and the animal-based research field. On the human side, uh, one of their goals is to increase diversity in research studies, so the population of, of human subjects. They'd like to increase diversity on that aspect. Obviously, on the animal side, the subjects are the animals, so I think their goal on the animal side is to increase diversity in the workforce for not only IACUC committees, but you know, animal husbandry technicians, veterinary technicians, you know, managers, regulatory people, compliance people. So I want to be very clear about the definition of diversity. Not just race. It's socioeconomic, Correct. educational level. Correct. Thank you. On the animal side, what I've seen is um, in the husbandry field, the technicians that take care of, of the animals, I usually see a lot of racial diversity in that. Um, the veterinarians, I'm seeing more diversity now than I did when I first started. When I first started, there were primarily males, primarily white males, and now what I see in the research side, I see a lot of females, a lot of females, and a lot of different races and veterinarians. It's in the middle that I don't see much diversity, like when I consider myself in the middle. Um, I don't see a lot of African American females in the middle. Uh, there are some vet techs I've seen, but in the regulatory field, I don't see a ton. But it's a very, very small field also. And also, I don't see a lot of people who um, have disabilities. In my career, I've only worked with one technician who, actually, he was deaf. And you don't, I, I personally have not seen a lot now. It might be a lot out there, but I personally have not seen it. So if, if we were to problem solve, why do you think there is not as much diversity as we would hope for. I don't know if a lot of people know that this field exists because it is so small and so specialized. Um, I think we need to bring people into the field. We need to, to mentor them up through the field. Again, that's the only reason I'm in it. I was mentored into it or else I would have probably stuck with some sort of lab work or something like that. But I was mentored into the, the regulatory aspects of, of this field. And I think that that's what we need to do because I had never heard of this. There's a certain educational level that has to be attained to, to do this work. Some of it. Mm -hmm. Yes, some of it. Um, a lot of uh, animal technicians have high school diplomas. Then there are, there are veterinary technicians that go to two-year programs. And there are people... So it's not unattainable. It's not unattainable at I all. just don't know that it's a path that... It exactly. Well, I, I know a lot of vet tech programs now have, um, have a research component to them, whereas many, many years ago, vet tech programs were primarily training vet techs to take care of your dog and cats in private practice. There were very few that trained veterinary technicians to take care of animals and research. So 
I think that's increasing the path for vet techs and research. Now, about increasing the diversity in the schools, from what I've heard, and again, this is just what I've heard, uh, it's primarily females now in vet tech programs. You find very few males entering the field. I don't know why that is. I have no idea why that is. Um, but again, it starts with, with young people. You have to introduce these jobs or these careers, these paths, to young people so they see what's out there. You know, people know that veterinarians are out there. Everyone knows that. But no one else, you know, they don't know what else is out there. On one of our conference calls, one of the diversity advisory group conference calls, I spoke about maybe making a fact sheet to, to give to junior colleges or high schools or something like that. Career guidance centers at the high schools. I haven't had good luck with guidance. <laughs> I didn't have a good guidance counselor at my high school, and neither did my friends that I went to high school with. You know, my guidance counselor told me to be a secretary because I was excellent at typing. Excellent at typing. She's really. <laughs> Clearly, you must be a secretary then. <laughs> That's what she told me to do. I should be a secretary. And I said, but I like science. And she said, no, you should be a secretary. So I think you need to train the guidance counselors so they know what's out there. When my daughter was in high school, now granted she's a freshman in college now, so it wasn't that long ago. Um, I don't know if her guidance counselors knew about this field. I have no idea. Well, the, the bad things I see on the internet, the fact that anybody can put anything on there and people believe it. So right there, to me, that's bad. Um, good things. Yeah, there are a lot of good things on the internet about research. You know, you have people telling their stories, people who, you know, overcome illnesses thanks to research. That's out there, but you don't really hear about that. You don't hear about the good things. You always hear about the bad things. Uh, as far as the media, I don't see very many bad things anymore in the media. You see a lot of stories on research and they have to be vetted, obviously, because things can be misconstrued. But this is the, these are the times we live in, and people can take things out of context, and you know, they can just show a snippet and just blow it all out of proportion. So that's what I think about the media. If you could have your way with regards to uh, diversity in the field of research, um, without regard to resources, in other words, it doesn't matter how much it costs or if anybody likes your idea, <laughs> if you could do whatever you wanted to better diversify the people who are involved in all aspects of research, what would you do? Public service campaigns. I think people pay attention to that. I really do. I think the, the main thing is to explain the benefits of being in this field, you know, not, you know, working benefits, but the benefits to humans mm -hmm. and animals. Mm -hmm. They might not know how it works, but I think the average person does support animal use and research because people, people want cancer cured. They want AIDS cured. And if you can show them the pathway from animals to humans, the translational research, I think that's just going to educate them more. But I think deep down people do support the use of animals in research. Not everyone, of course. And you're never going to have 100% ever. I wish the human race understood that it was necessary and it should be supported. It really should be supported. Financially, it should be supported. That's the main thing, because it takes money. It takes money to do this. I was in a couple of research studies, nothing too heavy. Um, I've always worked at universities um, that were associated with hospitals, and a lot of hospitals are learning that if they advertise their clinical trials, that's a way to get subjects. 
And since I worked there, you know, I would always do something really simple. I was involved in an exercise study. Um, they wanted to see if chocolate affected exercise or something. Oh, it was, sign me up. <laughs> see, I'm not a chocolate lover, really. <laughs> And I did it because of the exercise. I wanted to increase my exercise and involved a gym membership and I had to go and it, it was fun. So I've been involved in research studies like that. My father's family has a history of kidney disease and I know that one of my great uncles did receive a kidney transplant in the 60s and that definitely is a result of animal-based research. I've gotten in, involved in conversations. They weren't heated conversations. There were people who clearly didn't understand. Um, and I would explain exactly how it works. You know, the fact that the animals are seen by veterinarians, the fact that we are required to give anesthetics and analgesics, the fact that, you know, we use antibiotics when necessary. It, uh, people just don't know. In all the encounters that I've had, people just didn't know. And how did they respond when you educated them? They were done. <laughs> I mean, really, you know, the conversation was essentially over. I've never been involved in heated arguments ever, ever. Yeah, you know, I'm not a tiny little person, so maybe, and, and you can tell I'm passionate when people have asked me about it, so maybe they just kind of backed off. I don't know. I went from Ohio to New York um, I went from being a compliance coordinator to director of an IACUC. And my first job was at Columbia. My first director job was at Columbia University. And then I went to NYU Langone Medical Center. The move was eye-opening. I felt like I came from a little small town moving into New York City. I came from Cleveland, Ohio to New York City. And it seemed like a little small town to the great big city. Um, as far as the job, it's a greater scale, a larger scale than, you know, I was just doing compliance before, but now I'm doing everything. Well, at my current job, I'm the director of the IACUC and the IBC, the Institutional Biosafety Committee. So that committee walks in between the human and, and animal world because we do have human subjects that receive recombinant DNA. Mm -hmm. So... I like that a lot. I really like the aspects of the IBC because it's, it's different than what I'm usually doing. So, I, I mean, I really enjoy it. We're all talking about compliance. That's one of the things that's top of our list, compliance. So compliance in human subjects, compliance in the animal subjects. We both talk about protocols. We both talk, talk about funding. Um, it's just a different subject, a, a different research subject.